Exactly. So you're you're saying my, my what I just said makes it a tactical right uh, re- and yeah, I think that in polemics and theological polemics, tactical things are are sometimes helpful to establish some common ground and to say, well, look, we agree about this. Right. Here's where we really disagree. And since Arminius did say it, I'm just saying to Calvinists, don't say that classical Arminianism is semi-Pelagian, because here's what Arminius said. Right. Now, whether he was right or not is another question. I'm just arguing from historical theology that they're wrong when they say Arminianism is semi-Pelagianism. Now, whether they're wrong when they say the traditional Baptist view that you're describing is semi-Pelagian, I'm not going to jump in and defend, you know, the traditional Southern Baptist view as you've expressed it, because that's not quite what I understand Arminianism to believe. I'll let you and the guys you mentioned defend yourselves. And uh, I think it would be helpful in uh, this—what's the right word— I don't want to use any kind of violent language, yeah. but in this debate, <laughs> yeah, in this debate, it would be helpful if we all non-Calvinists lined up kind of together and said, "Look, we agree with you that the natural fallen person is incapable of making a faith decision apart from a special work of the Holy Spirit freeing their will to say yes." And that comes through the gospel preached and taught and communicated to them. And if we all lined up and said that, then this whole accusation of semi-Pelagianism might just die away. And I wish it would. Yeah, and I, I, I don't like the term semi-Pelagianism because I think it is kind of the boogeyman uh, and, it, and, it, yeah. and it thwarts a good discussion. And I can understand the desire to just avoid that discussion altogether. But, but I, in my opinion, it, it concedes too much. Um, and, yeah. and I do think that, well, the fact that semi-Pelagianism didn't begin until Beza, uh, in, I mean, at least the terminology of semi-Pelagianism right. didn't be, be begin until Beza in the 15, you know, what, 1566 or something like that. I think that's from David Allen's uh, article on why, why Calvinism, I mean, why the traditional statement cannot be semi-Pelagianism, which I have at Sociology 101 for those who are interested in getting to the nuances of that. He does go through that really in detail to, to explain that the, the issues that they are discussing originally between Pelagius and Ar- uh, Augustine um, do not really uh, pertain to our, our our nuanced differences even in this discussion, and he explains very clearly why that is with references to original sources. Um, but the, the reason I push back on that is to be able to say, you know, I think we should be able to stand together to be able to say that, that, that we need the gospel, that the gospel is the power of God into salvation, not that the gospel plus some supernatural extra work that has to happen is is the power of God into salvation and and that's that's again it may be a nuance in the way we do it um, I just think that when it comes to other issues of discussion and that may be a tactical side of, uh, for me is that there's other tactical issues that when you when you concede that point for example when you said that the person has to be freed okay so so a person could be freed and then not saved what are they being you know what I mean? So, in other words, they can yeah. be preveniently graced um, and and made alive or quickened or freed to some degree, but still mm-hmm. but still refuse the gospel and be lost. So they can they can be freed and still bound at the same time. Well, they can be freed and say no, and that's the essence of free will. That they have the option to say no to God's offer of free grace. Uh, but they also have the option of saying yes. Right. And without prevenient grace, they really don't have that choice. But so what, I don't, you know, this is <laughs> yeah. This is getting into the weeds, I think. Yeah, of, no, uh, it kind of is. You know, and, and, the weeds. I guess yeah. I would just push to say that if somebody's in bondage, they can still admit they're in bondage without being freed from the bondage, like an alcoholic, for example. An alcoholic right. can still be addicted to alcohol and say. I, I am addicted to alcohol, and I need to be checked into a rehab facility and submit to that without being freed from the addiction first. And in the same uh-huh. way, I think that we can be still in bondage to sin, but have the capacity to admit or confess, yeah, we're I'm in bondage to sin, and I need I need a Savior. I need help. And, and therefore, to be regenerated 
uh, through faith, not you know pre faith regeneration, which I know you you also reject the concept of pre faith regeneration, but it seems as if there's some kind of regenerative work, at le- or at least a portion of regenerative work that's happening on the Armenian structure. Um, mm-hmm. That's that to me the tactical problem. I guess is where I'm getting at is that seems to make it more tactically difficult to argue against. You know, Sproul and others' version of pre, you know, this pre-faith regeneration, this effectual yeah. work of God that you know has to happen in in order for somebody to believe the gospel, and that that's difficult for me at least to get over. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, <clears throat> did you hear? Did you listen to that? Did you hear that? That that's that's extremely helpful. Did, did, was there was there something you wanted to? Um, I just thought it was really interesting that they were uh, appealing to. I, I guess we'll call it Dead People's Anonymous. You know, you talked about it's not like it's AA or or something like that. They still can make and it's like okay, so dead. We're back to the moral neutral ground, the right. prevenient grace. But then, as far as the choices go, we're still, you know, the, the people aren't actually all that. Dead. No, of course begin not. With. No, so, you know, no. We're but, back to you know the, the he uses the AA analogy, and I'm like, well, actually, dead people's analogy. Uh, well, see, analogy. the thing is, we we can agree with Leighton Flowers. The not only is there just no biblical basis for the concept at all of prevenient grace, it's just not there. It is the cellophane tape of Arminianism. Um, and if you've ever tried to hold something together with cellophane tape, it doesn't hold together very long, and certainly not under much pressure. Um, so I, he's right that it doesn't make any sense to have someone partially freed, partially regenerated, whatever, by some prevenient grace concept. That, that doesn't make any sense. But what's Leighton's, why is Leighton saying that? Because he is denying that there needs to be any exertion of divine power to make it possible for mankind to savingly believe. Never mind that Jesus said you're not able to. Ah, no, 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 no. We're going to run someplace to the Old Testament and find some place where somebody did something good, and that's good enough. We don't have to worry about Jesus' explication of any of that stuff. But once again, who's the guy in history that argued that we have this capacity in and of ourselves without the necessity of grace? Um, oh, we, we need grace because we need the Gospels of grace. What he just argued, you just listen to it, is he's arguing against Olson because Olson is saying there needs to be prevenient grace. Prevenient grace doesn't save, but it brings a person to a position where they can make that choice. He's saying we don't need to be brought to a position. We can just always make that choice. Who said that in history? Give you a hint. His name starts with a P and ends with an Aegeus. I just play him, folks. I just play him. Thanks to the individual on Facebook. 